Welcome to the Psych Central Show, where each episode presents an in-depth look at issues from the field of psychology and mental health, with host Gabe Howard and co-host Vincent M. Wales. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of the Psych Central Show podcast. My name is Gabe Howard, and with me, as always, is Vincent M. Wales. Before we get on to our incredible guest and, and somebody who I've enjoyed working with for a number of years now. We want to remind everybody to support our sponsor. The sponsor supports the show and that's why we're here. So remember you can get a week of convenient, affordable, private online counseling anytime, anywhere by visiting betterhelp.com slash psych central. And without further ado, Mr. Pete Early, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Gabe. Oh, it is absolutely. Vincent. Glad to have you. That's right. Vin's Thanks. here. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> I, you know, I forget. I forget. I first met Pete, and, and I say met, we, we met online because that's the way a lot of mental health advocacy is because, you know, travel and planes are expensive. But he, you write a very popular blog covering mental health advocacy topics. And what I like about the blog is that it covers all sides. You, you have you know, the, the, the medical opinion, you have organizations like NAMI, you have the family member voice, and then there's my voice, which is the, the lived experience voice that you also include. And you include this all in, you know, kind of a one-stop shopping space so that people can get really a well-rounded view of, uh, you know, this, I'm going to say this entire mess, uh, but everything to do with mental health. So the first question that I have right out of the gate is, why did you create that space? Like what it's atypical. You know, most people create a blog and only talk about their opinion, but you went a different way. Well, I think part of it's my journalistic background because I came from the Washington Post. And I wish everybody felt the way you do because uh, not everybody thinks it's always fair or balanced or they think it's highly opinionated. But what I discovered when I uh, did my book, um, I didn't think anybody, for instance, could object to the idea that we shouldn't be inappropriately incarcerating people for trespassing, et cetera, who have a mental illness. And I discovered, oh no, there are people who say, you know, look, I'm a person with lived experience. I break the law, I need to be in jail. And on the other side are people like me who say, wait a minute. But I also learned early on that, um, that I didn't know everything. And quite frankly, um, my book came out in 2006. I'd probably write a different book today uh, than I did then because of what I've learned. But to answer your question about the blog, the reason I did the blog is after, look, my son has a mental illness. That, that makes it personal. And right. after I finished my book, Crazy, and the, and the title is um, A Father's uh, Search Through America's Mental Health Madness, and Crazy refers to the system, not people with mental illness, obviously. But I wanted to do a book about successful programs. And I was going to do kind of like a travels with Charlie or blue highways where I'd go to Pittsburgh and see mental health courts and then go to Denver and see homeless shelters and then go to California and highlight all these things. And my publisher said, nobody cares about that. Nobody wants to read that. And so I thought, I just can't walk away from this. And so then I spent three months with the homeless and the publisher said, Ugh, nobody wants to put down $32 to read about people who are, uh, psychotic on the street, unless you want to go homeless. And I thought, well, that's a little fraudulent. And so I thought the blog is the answer. That's where I can just, it's my thoughts on the paper, the way I see things. And then I thought I need different points of view because I've never had a mental illness. And as my son reminds me, he sees things like involuntary commitment uh, and medication much different than I do. Very true. Very true. And, and and I appreciate you doing so. It's funny that you said that people think that your blog is opinionated. Well, yeah, I, I, I think that it would be lacking if it didn't have an opinion. I mean, otherwise it's, it's what, like a term paper? I, and, but I, what I like about your blog is that I do believe that it is, you know, balanced and it is obvious when it is your opinion. I've never once seen you declare something a fact that is it, your assessment of. Uh, you're very clear on that. And I think that is because well, you write like a journalist. We tend to read things we already agree with because they reinforce what we believe. And so like, because I'm a political junkie, I, I get up in the morning and I watch Morning Joe and hear everybody talking about how the president is a real jerk. And I flip it over to Fox and Friends and hear about how Hillary needs to be arrested. And then I flip it back because we, more and more we're living in this world where everybody's their own little tribe. 
And I think that's really dangerous in mental health. All of us should should recognize that the reason we're doing this is because we care about a person with mental illness or we have a mental illness. And that's got to be the central issue. So you've got to hear people who have the illness, and then you all have to hear all these different other points of view. But the center, to me, always has to be focusing on the person who has the mental illness and, and what's the best way to try to help that person. And even saying that makes some people mad, as I was reminded in a recent meeting, saying, well, you're, you're suggesting everyone with mental illness needs help. But, you know, the people I dealt with in jails and prisons was, needed help. And, and I personally, I think all of us need help. So, you know, I don't find that offensive. Well, we that's the minefield spots. we're in. Yeah. Well, we are in a minefield. And, and I would say to that person, well, you're acting like nobody with mental illness needs help. And, it, you know, it, it's sort of an unwinnable accusation. Uh, I want to help people with mental health, mental illness. We all don't need help. Okay, well, I want to put out house fires. Well, not everybody's house is on fire. That, that's great. Sit down. I'm talking about the houses that are on fire. Um, but, you know, then that would be perceived incorrectly as well. So you're, you're right. We work in a tough field because I think there is, that it's political. And uh, I know a wonderful, a an, Yeah, <laughs> wonderful analogy. I'm going to steal it. <laughs> you, you can have it. Uh, you don't even have to steal it. It is my gift to you. And, uh, <laughs> Vin, you had a question. Sorry to cut you off there, buddy. No, that's all right. Pete, one of the things that that struck me the most when I when I read your book is the conclusion that, at least in California, and I'm sure it's in the rest of the country as well, a lot of mentally ill people have to commit a crime in, in order to get some treatment. And that's just absurd. That's crazy. It is crazy. That that. That is absolutely the truth. And now, um, you know, initially, uh, look, we were putting people in institutions. It was too easy. You know, there's always these famous cases. I don't know how much of them are really real or, or, you know, just legends, but the guy in Texas, whose wife didn't want to have sex with him. And so, you know, he had her committed or, you know, and I did see a case in St. Louis where the husband just had his wife lobotomized because uh, she argued with him. So, I mean, it was ridiculous. Um, so in, you know, danger self for others became the standard. What has happened is that now hospitals and insurance companies are flipping that on its head. And by that, what I mean was it was a set up as a civil rights protection to help those from people from being abused. Now it's hospitals and insurance companies are saying, well, we don't need to treat you until you become dangerous. Uh, a real quick story. So my son is, goes off his meds. And um, I call up and I say, look, my son's off his meds. Can you send a team over to evaluate him? They said, is he dangerous? I say, no. Well, wait until he's dangerous. So then he gets dangerous. And I call the same guy back and I say, look, my son is violent. He's just chased us out of the house. Please come. And he says, well, wait, is he dangerous or violent? And I said, he's violent. And they say, oh, we don't come then. You call the police. Well, the police came and shot him twice with the taser. So that's the situation you get into trying to set the level being, that's one of the problems with the dangerous level. And that now has creeped over uh, to hospitals and insurance companies saying, well, you know, you can go into an insur uh, a hospital and say, look, I really feel suicidal. I'd like to check myself in. Well, do you have insurance? And um, how dangerous are you? How suicidal are you? And that's ridiculous. Well, and of course, like you pointed out, how do we define violence? How do we define dangerous? This is tricky. And for, as speaking purely as somebody who lives with a mental illness, it pains me to know that if I get sick, my loved ones are going to have to call the police. If I pass out- Well, you haven't broken a law. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, what's the old cliche is, you, do, you, know, when, you know, you don't call the police when somebody has a heart attack you know, and yet that's who we rely on in the in these situations. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp.com. Secure, convenient, and affordable online counseling. All counselors are licensed, accredited professionals. Anything you share is confidential. Schedule secure video or phone sessions, plus chat and text with your therapist whenever you feel it's needed. A month of online therapy often costs less than a single traditional face-to-face -face session. Go to BetterHelp.com forward slash Psych Central and experience seven days of free therapy to see if online counseling is right for you. BetterHelp.com forward slash Psych Central. 
I also want to bring up an, another pet peeve I have, which will, uh, upsets people when I write about it in my blog, which is serious mental illness. SAMHSA defines a serious mental illness as any illness that disrupts your life in a meaningful way. A lot of people like to define it as schizophrenia, bipolar, or major depression. That's it. And that's a fight that always goes on within the National Alliance of Mental Illness. How do you know when somebody has a serious mental illness? You're cruising along, everything's going fine, and then you crash. At what point does it become a serious mental illness? And so, you know, I understand that there's a lot of pressure to say, let's fund serious mental illnesses. And the, the key word is, you know, the, the worried well, you know, the person who's been divorced three times. But when does the 14-year-old cutter all of a sudden develop a mental illness? When she raises the razor blade higher? Or is she still because she's a cutter and that doesn't, you know, interrupt her life in the same way someone who's homeless? I mean, these are all these terms divide us and separate us. And we end up saying, well, you don't deserve any funding because you just have depression. You don't have it serious enough. Whereas my son has schizophrenia. And instead of fighting for scraps, we should be demanding care for everybody. This is what I call the suffering Olympics. It's, it's a phrase that I coined a long time ago where basically all the people who are suffering have to compete. We all have to compete for money that's frankly scraps, as you pointed out, so that we can care for the people that either ourselves, the people that we love, both. And it's nonsense. We're already sick and now we have to figure out how to get help and we have to hope that we're sick enough or diagnosed with whatever is popular so that we can get the help that we need. And it's, it's a mess. It's an absolute mess. It's crazy. <laughs> that is a theme. <laughs> Let, let's talk about crazy for a minute, the, the book crazy, because it, it's a great book and it's, I read it from the perspective of somebody who lives with mental illness. So in, in some of it, you know, I'm like, oh, wow, that is definitely societal overreach, the parental overreach. I, I'm a person. And then I read it, you know, and then I was like, oh, wow, wow. I didn't realize that this is what society went through because of my illness. So then I felt really, really bad. And, you know, by the end, I, I saw, you know, like you said, how crazy this whole thing is. Talk to me about what you were thinking when you wrote the book, because your story is not over. You're still a father with a son. You still have to deal with the mental health system. But, you know, the, the book obviously needed to have a beginning and a middle and an end. Right. And, you know, after the book came out, uh, we went through six more years until my five hospitalizations, until my son finally got the help and everything he needed. And I always like to point out that today he is an amazing success story because he got the proper care and a wonderful case manager. And when I say proper care, I'm talking about housing and help getting a job. And we can talk about some of those things as you want. But now he's halfway through graduate school. So he's just doing fantastic. That's, that's the goal, should be the goal for, for everyone. But how the book came about, of course, is that I couldn't get him help. And as a journalist, I was so frustrated by the system. I took him to the hospital. The doctor, you know, said uh, he doesn't meet the dangerous criteria. You bring him back when he tries to kill you or kill someone else. And I was just horrified. And I, I said, you can't do that. And, he's, and he said, well, he doesn't meet the criteria. He says he's not going to hurt anybody. He can tell you who the president is. He knows what spilled milk means. And I said, yeah. And he also, you know, thinks God has him on a special mission and he's going to marry Natalie Portman. And the guy says, well, you know, 24 hours later, he breaks into a, a stranger's house and to take a bubble bath and gets arrested. What I thought when I was writing the book is, you know, as a journalist, I wanted to figure out what was going on. And, and I ended up going down to Miami Day Jail. And it was the toughest assignment I've ever done in my life because I really had to compartmentalize it because I'd go in and be with these correctional officers who were, uh, none of them had any training. All of them treated the people with mental illness like they were animals. There was no respect. Uh, you come up to C-Wing, C-Block, and it's 19 cells, and they all face each other. 
and you'd be brought up there, you'd be told to strip naked in front of everyone, including female officers, everything else. You're dehumanized. You're thrown into a cell naked, a cell that's supposed to hold two people, four or five people in there, you know, some actively psychotic. And it's just so dehumanizing and so horrific. And so I had to look at that and spend 10 months and at first I was just so shocked how could you could treat people like this and then I thought about how right outside the Washington Post when I worked there how we we walked by people every day who were psychotic and we turned and we looked at them and said well they must want to be homeless or they must want to be addicted or they must want to live this or they have some character flaw and when in fact uh, we didn't want to admit it because then we would just feel awful trying not to help. Some, I mean, we're not helping people. And also we'd be scared because, wow, it happened to us. So it was, it, I had to compartmentalize. I didn't tell anybody I had a, a son with mental illness. And uh, then I'd go back to my hotel and literally cry some nights because I kept thinking, this is my son's future. Uh, this is, I could be writing about him. Uh, you know, he could be the guy under the bunk who I still see in my nightmares chewing on orange peels naked, you know, right. and uh, that that just breaks breaks a person's heart. You've got to put a face on these people. And that's why I'm so thrilled that you guys are doing your podcast. It's not until we step out of the shadows and we say, look, you know, this isn't about them and us. It's about we. I love that. I love that. I agree. I do, too. That's that's right. That's excellent. My biggest frustration is this. Um, Crazy has been a powerful book. I mean, it's helped influence legislation in Congress. Uh, Senator Cornyn, Senator Murphy, Representative Tim Murphy, all these people have mentioned it. They've talked about it and helping in in Florida. It's done wonders. A lot of states have adopted it. I'm not bragging about that. I'm just saying that it, it reflects how frustrated people are the movement really wasn't mental health. It was police and sheriff who didn't want to pay for people who were in their jail. They didn't want them in there. But my big frustration is we never were able to break the book out. And what I mean by that is it's, it's on its 22nd printing, but who's reading it? People with mental illness, parents, professionals. We aren't hitting the peat early before his son got sick because nobody walks into a bookstore and says, oh, I think I'll read a, a, a story about somebody whose son goes psychotic, you know, unless it's a cutesy novel where, you know, at the end, love saves everybody. Um, <laughs> it, you know, it, what's a beautiful, beautiful mind. A beautiful you know? mind. Yeah. You know, it, it's yeah. funny that you mentioned that. And, and I say that because this is, this is my life as well. You know, my life as a speaker and my life as you know, a podcaster and a writer the choir loves me. And I, I'm not saying that to brag either. People right. who live with mental illness uh, or their families, they're just like, wow, that is a really interesting perspective. That's a good way to put it. You're right. We do need to get together. But I could put out a sign right now uh, you, you know, that says, hey, come and listen to everything you want to know about the mental health system, about being mentally healthy, defeating mental illness, and getting the services that you need before you need them and I get three people in the room and it, you know that that's it and well this is this is what there's two interesting points here one is that people who are involved in it like me cling to people like you because you give us hope everyone who is successful in their recovery they they don't realize the impact they have when my son was going through his worst I would look at people who are doing well and say that's I can do, he can do that. He can do that. And you're yeah. desperate for hope when you're at the, at the very bottom. I've also discovered the importance of partnership. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean, you are a fantastic speaker. You tell your story, people are moved. Okay. But half that audience is sitting there thinking, well, I'm not going to get a mental illness. That's not going to happen right. to me. When a parent does it, especially somebody who may look like them or who's been, you know, successful or whatever, and they say, this has happened to my child, it scares them. Because then they go, oh my gosh. When I give a speech, you'll be amazed at how many 20 to 25, 26 year old people who are just having children come running up afterwards and say, hey, you know, little Johnny does this or little Johnny. And I say, look, I'm not a professional, but it scares them because they realize 
you know, you got a human face on it. So I think it's, and I, I use that kind of as an analogy about how important it is for people who are living with mental health and those who love them to cooperate and not be enemies. And of course, that gets dicey because, you know, it's, you, my son was not happy. I mean, I've had him involuntarily committed and, you know, he got tasered by the police and those are, he's They're told scary. me to. They're yeah. incredibly scary. No, it's awful. <laughs> yeah. But you're right. That is how a lot of people like me end up getting care. Uh, you know, I was fortunate and I, I, somebody found me and tricked me into going to hospital and I was lucky because I had health insurance and resources and there was a bed available. I'm in a major city. So, you know, considering the stories that we have all heard and that you just told, mine was easy, but it was still terrifying. I, I woke up the next morning locked in a psych ward, a psych ward. Uh, you know how you talk about Pete early before all of this happened. There was a Gabe Howard before I was diagnosed. Mentally ill people were other people. They were others. I was fine. And so, you know, it's fascinating all of the stigma I put out into the world that ended up, you know, coming right back to bite me. And that is why I educate, because I'm hoping that the next person finds out before, you know, they wake up in a psychiatric ward. Um, and my story could have been much, much worse. I, I could have been. And, and, I certainly and that's the realization that. is, you know, you were lucky. My son's been very lucky because for every Gabe and every Kevin Early, there are Natasha McKenna who ends up getting tasered to death in the Fairfax County Jail. Uh, you know, there's J, J, J. Shamil Mitchell and Hampton Rhodes who his paperwork gets lost. He literally star he's starved to death by jailers. Uh, until he has a heart attack because he won't obey their orders and so they don't feed him. I mean, it, that's the kind of world we live in where there's, you know, 400,000 people homeless on the streets and what are we doing about it? And, uh, you know, that's that's the other alternative and it's a, just a small twist of the knob from uh, where you are to where those folks are and it shouldn't be that way. It's an illness for God's sakes. Pete, thanks for being on the show. You just have way more information, so we are excited to invite you back next week for part two. And everybody else, we'll see everyone, including Pete Early, next week. Thank you for listening to The Psych Central Show. Please rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes or wherever you found this podcast. We encourage you to share our show on social media and with friends and family. Previous episodes can be found at psychcentral.com slash show. PsychCentral.com is the Internet's oldest and largest independent mental health website. PsychCentral is overseen by Dr. John Grohall, a mental health expert and one of the pioneering leaders in online mental health. Our host, Gabe Howard, is an award-winning writer and speaker who travels nationally. You can find more information on Gabe at GabeHoward.com. Our co-host, Vincent M. Wales, is a trained suicide prevention crisis counselor and author of several award-winning speculative fiction novels. You can learn more about Vincent at vincentmwales.com. If you have feedback about the show, please email talkback at psychcentral.com.